Okay, hello. Um, this is for the engineering physics class, and because we have the tool of calculus at our disposal, we talked briefly in one of these previous little mini lectures about how the each of the instantaneous quantities, position and velocity and acceleration, are related to one another. And we saw that, for instance, the instantaneous velocity is equal to the time derivative of our function for position, more succinctly stated, just kind of at dx dt. Okay. And we also saw that the acceleration vector okay, is the time derivative of v as a function of t, or stated a little more succinctly, dv dt. All right. So if we have a mathematical function that describes any one of these quantities, then we can get from one to the other by simply taking the derivative, as long as we, for instance, um, know the function for the position of the object as a function of time, we can take its derivative with respect to time and get the velocity, right? And if we know the function describing the object's velocity, then we can take its time derivative and find that it is equal to the acceleration, all right? So we can actually go the other way, and often this is something that is done because as it turns out, as we will learn, acceleration of an object is related to the forces on an object. And if we know the forces, then we know the acceleration. And from acceleration, we can calculate, predict, what a velocity and position would look like for an object as a function of time. And normally how that works is the following. So if we integrate both sides of this equation on the top. So we have v is a function of time, dt. And we integrate the right-hand side of that equation. Like that. Well, this over here, right? Remember that integrals essentially just undo derivatives. And so by integrating, over a derivative, we just get back x as a function of time. And on the other side, well, this is a little more interesting because that tells us that if we know a function for velocity, then we can integrate it with respect to time to get the position of the object, right? So let me repeat that. Get my eraser here. Mm -hmm. Come back to that. Okay. Okay. So, in addition to that, we can also do this. So, we can take the second relation there. So, bring this down here. We can say, okay, well, let's do that same thing. So we have dt, v of t, dt. And on the other side, we have acceleration as a function of time. We're integrating that. Okay, whatever you do to one side, you have to do the other, right? Same old thing, except now we're integrating on both sides. And so what this is telling us is that the velocity function describing the motion of an object is going to be equal to a function describing that object's acceleration, okay, that integral of that over time. So using these two relations, if you know, say, the acceleration of an object as a function of time, well then you can determine what the velocity of that object is as a function of time. And if you know the velocity, of an object as a function of time, then you can do another integral and finally find the 
position of that object as a function of time. If you know enough about the particulars of that object's motion, okay, you can go from one to the other. Okay, so if you know something about the position of an object, you can take derivatives to find out about its velocity and acceleration. If you know something about the acceleration of an object, you can take integrals to find out about its velocity and position over time, okay, or as a function of time. All very handy, all right? And I'd like to show an example of how that's done uh, for these equations for constant acceleration that we've been talking about. So let's take a look at that. So we'll get my We'll just clear all the pen markings and we'll start over, okay? So let's make that assumption like we did when we sort of derived our equations of motion for constant acceleration using algebra. We're going to make the assumption that acceleration is constant. And then we'll just use our relations between uh, acceleration, velocity, and a position of an object, those integral relations, to calculate what the equations of motion should be. And I think we will find that they take on a very familiar form. So first, let's take a look at hmm, the velocity, right? That's the first step, okay? Because we know that acceleration is a constant. We don't really care what constant. It's just important that it is a constant. So we put that into our integral relation. And we know that, of course, <clears throat> when we do that integration, we're going to end up with some constant. That's something I left out of the last slide, okay? But is important to remember. Now, when we do this integral for a constant acceleration, right? So this is not a function of time anymore. It's just a number could be equal to 1, equal to 9.8 whatever, okay? doesn't matter. Because when you have a constant and you do an integral over that constant, well, all you get is that constant back and a factor of the integration variable. And we're left with this on the right-hand side of our equation. So this should already be looking kind of familiar. And if we then say, okay, well, um, <clears throat> If we call v at time zero initial velocity, like makes sense, well then if we put a zero into this equation up here, then we get the first term a times zero is just zero, and then we're left with this constant of integration, all right? And so this constant of integration is necessarily equal to the initial velocity. And so we can rewrite this equation in a little bit more of a specific form that shows us the exact same relationship between initial velocity, the velocity at some time, which we're free to call our final velocity, and at time plus a factor of acceleration times time. All right, so there's one of our equations of motion. Now, if we go one more step, well, then we can get um, another of the equations of motion, and then algebra can, substituting back and forth, can take us to the other two equations of motion that we talked about in the other mini lecture, okay? So again, um, if we know velocity of an object, then we can compute its position, okay? And again, this constant of integration that I shamefully left off of my integrals on the last slide, okay, is hanging out there when we do our integral to show this relationship in the first place. Now, um, in this case, for constant acceleration, we know that the velocity as a function of time takes on this form. And when we do that integral, we end up with v0 times time. We end up with 1 half at squared. And we still have the constant of integration hanging out there. And again, like we did here, well, what's the, what do we want to call this, our uh, position at zero time? Well, we call it the object's initial position. And if we plug in t equals zero onto this side of things, well, then that's a zero. And that's a zero, 
and there's a constant hanging out there. So the initial position of the object is just that constant of integration that's hanging out. And so we end up with an equation of motion that looks like this. Now this isn't exactly the same form that we had uh, in the other version, but note that this is exactly the same if we just do one last thing, which is to bring the x0 onto this side of the equation. Apologize for my nasty handwriting here. Uh, and this right here is just delta x, right? And then you can recognize the form of that exactly, okay? The other two equations of motion, like I said, are pretty trivial extensions of, extensions of these. We just substitute back and forth and we can get them. And this is how you can use calculus, namely integration, to derive uh, the equations of motion for constant acceleration. So I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you later.